70s were great, weren't they? <laughs> the year is 1976. Steve Jobs co-founds a little company called Apple Computers and Star Wars starts filming in Tunisia. Jimmy Carter is elected the 39th president. A Big Mac costs 75 cents and the average car around three and a half thousand dollars. A four-year-old me still hasn't discovered the hobby and Tamiya released the M16 variant of the US M3 half-track. There were three versions of these US half-tracks and I recall them being highly sought after in my younger years. As time passed, their availability became scarce, often commanding crazy money online, which more or less relegated the range to our memories. Moving forward nearly 50 years, and to me, I have chosen to crack open some of these molds and re-release some of these old kits. But was this a case of Tamiya cashing in on an aging demographic and conning us with our nostalgic memories? Or was this a genuine case of giving the people what they want? Would these kits be as good as we remembered, or would it be like introducing our children to the movies we thought were so amazing when we were kids, only to find out that they were really pretty lame by today's standards? So there was only one way to find out, and that was to build the kit and let you judge for yourselves. I decided to build the kit out of the box and resist the urge to add aftermarket in the hope that I could present the model as it was designed and meant to be built all those years ago. Construction begins with the framework for the 450 cals, as well as preparing the ammunition canisters. Each canister for the section is comprised of two halves, and once the glue had set, I went about removing the seams. Easier said than done given the detail in the part was broken by that join, but I did the best I could using a ceramic scraper, and then the joint was then refined a little further with a sanding stick. A small touch of Tamiya Extra Thin helps blend and mask that seam after the sanding process. The 50 cals also required a considerable amount of cleanup as there was a pronounced seam running down the length of that part. I'm using the ceramic scraper here due to an unfortunate slip with the blade earlier in the day. The ceramic scraper is an efficient tool that minimizes the risk of injury, so I decided to focus my efforts using this tool from now on. The ends of the barrels had no hole in them either, so a small micro drill is a quick and easy way to add a little extra detail in these parts. I'd attach the ammunition canisters to one side of the mount, but had a change of heart on the other side. Leaving these canisters off will make the painting process a little easier for me, so they were left off on this one side at least. The construction of the M45 quad mount was simple and included the small engine and battery that allowed it to operate autonomously from the half track. Detail was basic and I really had to fight the urge to add wiring and include a little more scratch built detail to these areas. I'd committed to this out of the box, so I had to make peace with the soft detail. Again, there was a considerable amount of seam lines and pin marks in the pieces, and this was fast becoming a common thread with this kit. The inner walls of the quad mount had three big, ugly ejector pin marks in the otherwise lovely textured finish in the part. So back to the scraper it was, only this time I had to try and recreate the textured finish. I did this by applying a slow drying liquid cement over the area and then stippling it with an old brush. It looks a little rough now, but it should look okay under a coat of paint. The gun mount was then set aside and focus moved to the chassis. The part was yet again covered with prominent seam lines that required a considerable amount of removal. In reality, a lot of these blemishes would be hard to detect on the finished model, but the one you neglect is the one that will haunt you when it's too late, so I was being as diligent as I could to try and remove them. There were three variants in this half-track range from Tamiya, so a small amount of modification to the chassis was required for this specific variant. All of the M16s included the extended bumper and winch, 
So removing these sections of the molding would allow those parts to be attached at a later time. The arms for the idler wheels, rear springs and front springs are attached to the chassis. The detail in these parts is a reminder that we're dealing with a 50 year old kit, but a lot of this will be hard to detect on the finished model. The exhaust pipe is then improved by again heading to the micro drill and reaming out the end of the pipe. Expanding the hole reduces the chunky look of that molded part and will present a far more realistic looking pipe section. The seam lines are removed from the axle assemblies and then they're attached to the chassis. The front axle includes the front wheel hubs as movable parts connected with a steering rod. This means the wheels will be posable in a turning position if you'd like. The axle for the drive wheels is then attached in place. The wheel assemblies include a small polycap sandwiched in the center of each wheel. And for those of you new to the hobby, the polycap will allow me to easily fit and remove the wheels from the axles, which will in turn allow for a better experience when it comes time to paint the model. Assemblies for the housings for the road wheels and the track section are now completed. There is a damper spring there that is very soft on detail and a little misleading when looking at the instructions as there's no locating holes for it. It just sits flush with the framework. So check your references and just check how I've installed mine if you're unsure. The driver and passenger doors have a small armored flap that could be installed in an upright position when under attack or folded down in quieter times. You have the option in the kit to pose the flap in the open or closed position. The doors come with it molded in the closed position so a sharp blade was required to trim the part so it could be attached in the folded down position. I'm trying to not be too critical but the thickness of the part is terribly overscale. But this was something I'd have to turn a blind eye to once again. The same treatment was required for the armoured flap on the rear plate. In order for the quad mount to be unimpeded in combat, the flaps on the rear and the side of the tub would need to be folded down. Folding the flaps down would give me more options as to how I could use the model in the future and it also allowed me to showcase the quad mount a little easier. So yes, the thickness of the plate was very overscale. But for the sake of the exercise, I was okay with it. The toolboxes are then set in place and the top flap was glued in over the top of them in its resting position. Ejector pin marks are an unfortunate consequence of the molding process, but manufacturers have become far better at placing them in user-friendly places, which just isn't the case with the parts in this kit. Multiple pin marks required time-consuming sanding along the side walls, some of which were a little tricky to navigate but needed to be addressed because they'd be very obvious if I had not have. Now to the cabin and the shape is constructed by fitting the two side walls, the engine cover and the armoured grille to the moulded floor section. You have the option of posing the slats in the open or fully closed position for that radiator armor. In reality, these flaps had four positions that could be adjusted by the driver in order to offer more protection to the engine bay when under fire. The battery box and Pioneer tools are also added at this point. I've left the dash out as well as the glass for the windscreen, but we'll address those details a little later. I wanted to have a little fun with the chipping with some of these parts around the model. In reality, the olive drab paint was a very good paint and chipping was quite rare. But as modelers, there is nothing stopping us using a little artistic license here and there. SMS paints are a lacquer base paint and I love their range of metallics. So I wanted to base coat some of the parts and the ammunition cans and the floor of the tub using their aluminium color. About 15 minutes later, I was able to create a basic mask with tape and apply two coats of chipping fluid to the part. This mask will allow me to create some targeted chipping and ensure I don't go too overboard with it. 
With the two coats in place, I can then remove the mask and apply my olive drab. I'm mindful not to flood the surface because doing so will harm my chances of the chipping fluid working properly. A couple of light misted coats will work best. I then moisten the areas that had the chipping fluid on them with a soft brush and water. The water will reactivate the chipping fluid and allow me to start the chipping process. You can see I'm able to create interesting chips along that raised section on the floor panel. For the doors on the floor where the two loaders would have sat, I used a more targeted approach and carefully created the chips using a toothpick. The water and the chipping fluid allows me to easily remove the top coat and leave realistic looking chips. That chipping process is repeated on the quad mount as well as some of the spare ammunition cans around the model. I decided to use a combination of olive drab variants on the ammunition cans to add a little interest to them. So playing with the tones and the shades when working on these monotone subjects is a great way to make for a far more interesting model. We interrupt this broadcast for a special news flash. So viewers, time for a giveaway. And to celebrate this build series of the re-released Tamiya Half-Track, the M16, I would like to give you guys the chance to win the model for yourself. All you have to do is like and make sure you subscribe to the channel, like this video, and leave a comment below and just say greetings from the country you are from and have the little flag emoji and then I will know that you're entered into this competition and I'll also get a look to see at where the people from around the world are joining in from which is giving me a real kick and a buzz. I'll announce the winner of this kit on the last Friday in February 2024 of course and we will get in touch and I'll arrange to send this kit out to you. Thanks again for watching the video and I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of it. Let's get back to it. A mix of acrylic paints is used to paint the details around the gun mounts and the guns and the battery were painted first in a black grey and then the various details were highlighted in pretty much tones of grey. The underside of the engine block is moulded into the chassis and is also painted, however I'm planning to be weathering this one fairly heavily, so it was probably a little unnecessary. With all the bits and pieces pre-painted, the quad mount could now go together. Back to the AK Real Colour Olive Drab and the chassis was painted. Again, I was a little lazy in the fact that I hadn't bothered priming, but the lacquer paints don't really need it to adhere well to the plastic parts. I was using the dark green colour of the plastic to almost serve as a black base of sorts. The internals of the cabin, as well as the track assemblies and wheel hubs, were painted in that signature olive drab as well. The pads for the seats were pre-painted simply because I could access them easily. A base layer of khaki was applied and then highlighted with a buff. The frames of the seats could then be brush painted in an olive green and once touch dry they were glued in place. These half tracks had an armoured screen that could be dropped down by the crews for added protection. Downside to that was they had to remove the glass windscreen in order to do it. If you didn't, you'd damage the glass, so I thought I'd use this to my advantage and neglect fitting the clear piece of acetate into the frame. If you're planning on using it, be sure to use a PVA glue or something similar to ensure you don't taint the part with plastic cement or super glue. The dash had been pre-painted in a white colour, and this would be the colour that would be used for the dials. By then using a touch of liquid mask in the dial sections, I'm able to protect the white paint in those recessed areas and then paint the dash in an olive drab. The surface tension in that liquid mask makes it easy to apply within those recesses and create the perfect mask. After 10 minutes or so, I could then paint the dash and fit it into the cabin assembly. There are a lot of details and placards you could fit to the dash to make it look a little busier, but given I'm working out of the box, I made peace with the part and moved on. 
The front seats I'd pre-painted earlier could now also be attached. The side walls of the rear tub were glued in place and the track assemblies were attached to the chassis. Lead belcher was used to represent the polished sections of the drive and idler wheel. It's worth noting that drive wheel should have protruding teeth through the centre of the wheel circumference that would pull the track over it, however it is sadly absent in this kit. I'd been concerned about the vinyl tracks because I'd read a lot of people online saying how bad they were. But like I said, I'd committed to this out of the box build and I'd have to stand by it. The tracks and the wheels were removed from the vinyl sprues using a pair of nippers. The first thing I noticed was how rigid and stiff the vinyl was and how awkward it was to join the two ends. Once in place though, they seemed reasonably sturdy, however there was a little play in that joint under load. I found by heating the track with a hairdryer, the vinyl seemed to become softer and a little more pliable and I was able to get a look at what it looked like around the track and drive assemblies. Certainly not as bad as I'd feared. It was then a case of attaching the cabin and the rear tub to the chassis. I used Revell Contactor for the glue at this stage because the bottle allows me to get a better coverage of the glue and it is a reasonably slow setting cement. The cabin position was awkward to find its spot so the glue would give me a greater window to work around. The M16 boxing included the winch and front bumper and that is pre-assembled at this stage. The drop down armour on the sides was glued in place and just like in the other areas it is extremely overscale in terms of armour thickness but I'm sure this won't bother most modellers but I thought it was worth mentioning anyway. I'm then able to break the tracks and wheels down and start the paintwork on the exterior of the model. I really like the tone of the AK real colour olive drab that I'd used on the internal sections of the model so chose to stick with it for the exterior. As mentioned earlier I used the deep green colour of the plastic as a base coat of sorts to build my mid-tone colour up from. Allowing the odd section of the dark green to show through a little will create tones and shadows and variation in the base layer that should help create some visual interest in that monotone scheme. An AK colour called Faded Olive Drab is then used for my highlights. I'm focusing on the centres of the panels as well as horizontal surfaces. The contrast that that colour was giving me was a little too close to the base layer though so a touch of buff was added to the mix and this was then applied in an even smaller area and used to enhance the layers below rather than to cover them up. The AK real colour and the Tamiya paints mix perfectly as long as you were using a lacquer base thinner as your thinning agent. I could then go back with a fine brush and acrylic paint and paint the details around the model. It's always fun painting the tools and things like the straps because it adds those little pops of different colour around the model. Aluminium is used to paint the lights and the model then receives a coat of VMS satin varnish. With the major parts and the basic colours down, it feels like a good spot to wrap this week's episode up. This kit wasn't even close to being on my build list and I bought it on a whim purely for the nostalgia and figured it might make a good build series for anyone interested in the range. The kit also comes with three figures that I'm sure were groundbreaking at the time but don't really stack up by modern standards. I'm not really sure how I'll be displaying this model so based on the aging sculpts and the uncertainty I have, I decided not to include them at this stage. While the build was very straightforward, I found myself getting bogged down with cleaning seams and removing pin marks. I guess this is to be expected being a near 50 year old kit, but it was something I'd probably taken for granted in recent release kits. 
That's not to say there's no cleanup or ejector pin marks to deal with in a modern kit. It's just they seem to be getting more thoughtful with their positioning and the molds are far cleaner and more refined. For the most part at least. Yes, the detail in the kit is soft, unrefined and quite overscale in some cases, but if you are complaining about those things, you're probably missing the point. This is aimed at the aging scale modeler who remembers with fondness the Tamiya releases of yesteryear and wants to recapture the magic they delivered all those years ago. Is it a cash grab by Tamiya? or smart marketing, or just giving the market what they want, I'll let you be the judge. But no matter what the angle, there is no doubting these kits will be selling like hotcakes given the reasonable price they're asking for them. Of course there are better half-track kits on the market, and of course you could add aftermarket to upgrade these if you wanted, but that was never the point of this build. It was about squeezing as much life out of the model straight from the box, and then in part two, showing you how to weather it and take it from a basic model to the next level. And I can't wait to bring that one to you in a couple of weeks. Don't forget the giveaway guys, I'll be checking the comments below. Remember guys, this is the greatest hobby in the world. Share it with your family, share it with your friends and let's be proud of what we do. Until next time, I'll see you soon. Never underestimate nostalgia.